Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this webinar on microbes and sexual health. My name is Lorraine Clark. I'm a journal development editor here at ASM, and I work on the journal M Systems, which is hosting today's webinar. So we're going to um, begin with a brief overview of M Systems. We'll introduce speakers in the webinar format and then launch into the presentations, which will be followed by a panel discussion and Q&A. You're welcome to contribute any questions you may have by entering them in the Q&A section at the bottom of your Zoom panel, and we'll try to get to as many of them during the panel discussion. So the journal M Systems is an open access journal led by editor-in-chief, Dr. Jack Gilbert. M Systems publishes research in system biology ranging from an individual cell through entire microbial communities, including the development of new computational approaches to derive biological insight from these large data sets. So next, I just want to introduce a few M Systems initiatives. You can scan the QR codes for further details, and we'll also provide links to these in the chat. The journal has an ongoing special series on social equities and social equities and disparities uh, in microbial exposure, which is led by editor and also today's moderator, Dr. Sue Ishak, who is, uh, the, yeah, sorry, the series highlights recent investigations into beneficial and detrimental instances of microbial exposure in the context of how social policy may mediate or deepen disparities between and within populations. M Systems also has an ongoing collaboration with the journal Microbiology Resource Announcements. Authors of accepted original research articles in M Systems can consider submitting MRA companion articles focused on expanded rigorous analysis of data resources reported in the primary article. And now I'm going to introduce, oops, sorry, um, our moderator for today's webinar, Dr. Sue Ishak. She's an assistant professor of animal and veterinary science at the University of Maine in the School of Food and Agriculture. Since 2019, her lab focuses on host-associated microbial communities in animals and humans, and in particular, how hosts and microbes interact in the gut and can be harnessed to reduce inflammation. In addition to her research on microbes, Dr. Ishak is the founder of the Microbes and Social Equity Working Group, which currently has 300 members from over 22 countries. This group was formed to examine, publicize, and promote a research program on the reciprocal impact of social inequality in microbiomes, both human and environmental. Sue organizes an annual speaker series, annual virtual symposium, and had been the lead editor on our microbes and social equity special collections with the M Systems Journals. Sue, over to you. Thank you so much for that introduction and thank you everyone for joining us today. So as Lorraine mentioned, my background is mostly in microbes in the gut. I consider myself to be quote unquote an armchair enthusiast when it comes to microbes and sexual health. Luckily, I know some amazing researchers who are here today to share their work and their perspectives on this topic. So I'll go ahead and introduce our first speaker. Um, and Eldon, please feel free to get your screen share up while I do so. So our first speaker today is Dr. Eldon Yashetovich. Eldon, pronouns he him, is an assistant professor in the departments of obstetrics, gynecology, and reproductive sciences, and computational and systems biology at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. He is also principal investigator at McGee Women's Research Institute. Eldon received a PhD in neuroscience at the University of Missouri and the Thompson Center for Autism and Neurodevelopmental Disorders, studying the combined effects of maternal stress and diet on sex-specific brain development in mice. Eldon completed his postdoctoral training in the laboratory of Dr. Tracy Bale at the University of Pennsylvania and University of Maryland School of Medicine. His postdoc work showed that lifetime experiences influence the composition and function of maternal microbiome and vertical transmission of those communities is casually linked to poor health outcomes in offspring. Current research interests include mining the human maternal microbiota for novel functions that contribute to offspring development, and ultimately gaining a better understanding of the ways in which the prenatal environment shapes the postnatal response to the external microbial world. For this work, Eldon has been selected as a Kavli Fellow of the National Academy of Sciences and as a recipient of a National, National Research Service Award from NINMA. NIMH, and a Research Scientist Development Award from NIDDK. Um, well done, Eldon, and please feel free to take it away. 
Uh, so what I wanted to do actually for the next uh, 25 minutes or so is to give everyone a broad overview of how we think about uh, studying the microbiome in women's health using a lifespan approach, but really also to uh, address the question of how does someone that uh, stud started his career studying the neuroscience and the neurobiology of neurodevelopmental disorders uh, end up in uh, an area as dynamic as women's health and the microbiome, but particularly now in the context of sexual health across the lifespan. So uh, just to give you sort of a broad overview, uh, you know, so over the last 100 years, we've learned uh, an immense deal about the social, economic, and environmental determinants of health disparities. We know from epidemiological studies uh, that have identified many different environmental and social risk factors that contribute to uh, high risk into uterine environments. So, particularly focused on how do maternal lifetime experiences have an impact on fetal development, and then how this can potentially set uh, forth a trajectory towards uh, lasting outcomes. And we know all, a lot of these environmental factors, so they include things like uh, stress and trauma, consumption of high dense diets, uh, that is high in processed foods, fats and sugar, but low in a variety of important micro and mac uh, macronutrients. This also includes substance use disorders, environmental pollutants, uh, and uh, uh, they one of the things about the environmental exposures is that they're common, they frequently co-occur, and they're additively uh, contributing to negative health outcomes. So this becomes also really challenge if you're a reductionist or um, uh, someone that is studying preclinical models, because uh, it's one task to mechanistically link all of these outcomes to poor health um, uh, uh, across the lifespan, but it's a whole nother thing to start adding them. And then of course, in addition, uh, to these social environmental factors, this is one of the reasons why we're here, is that the microbiome itself is a um, biological and social risk factor that is known to impact the health of the mother and the child. And so uh, my lab and my group is particularly interested um, in three fundamental questions, uh, trying to link maternal lifetime exposure, so things like stress, diet, and infection, uh, and how could the microbiome be mediating this effect? And so the first question is really, what is the impact of these exposures on the fetal compartment? Um, and how does this set a trajectory of long lasting outcomes? The next is what is the potential role or impact of maternal exposures on the compositions and functions of the maternal microbiota? And then what is the impact of transferring these microbiota from offspring, from mother to offspring uh, that have been shaped by these lifelong experiences. And so we, as a, as a postdoc, uh, we did a lot of work trying to figure out particularly the role of stress, how it impacts not only the cervical vaginal microbiota, but also the uh, gut microbiota, and what are the consequences of transmission or vertical transmission of these cervical vaginal microbiota that have been shaped by uh, lifetime uh, trauma or lifetime stress exposures. Uh, and we've done this both in preclinical and in clinical settings, uh, trying to ask this question. And one of the things that we really did for some of this work is try to really separate out the contribution of um, the actual experience of in utero stress. So what is the consequence of being exposed to stressors uh, during pregnancy? And then uh, how does that actually interact with being exposed or being colonized by a microbiome that's been shaped by these stressors? Um, because they could really have two uniquely different effects. And then when they synergize, uh, they may actually be driving uh, poor health outcomes. And so while doing this work, um, one of the things that was really emerging is a lot of our um, uh, sort of a lot of discussions on vaginal seeding and bacterial baptism, right? So these are just some uh, screenshots from the internet. Some of them are actually from Instagram. Some of them are, are from uh, mommy blogs. Some of them are from Facebook groups that are really talking about the importance of vaginal seeding, right? So this is this idea that uh, babies that are born by cesarean section are missing, uh, quote unquote, a natural microbiota. And so one way to restore these microbiota is by uh, inserting a swab into the cervical vaginal space and then uh, during the C-section procedure to uh, wipe babies with it with the idea that you could partially restore. So of course the question then is, well, what's the evidence of that, right? And there's a whole slew of papers uh, that have come out over the last 10 or 15 years 
principally from groups like Maria Dominguez Bello's group, Jose Clemente's group, uh, really trying to figure out uh, how do things like the uh, cervical vaginal microbiota early in life, uh, how could they, in a, in a context of C-section, have an impact on um, babies. More recent work has now taken this a step further. This is from uh, a group in Finland where they have done uh, fecal microbiota transplantations uh, to babies uh, during this time, really asking this question. And so these are, um, a lot of these uh, studies have shown a beneficial effect of vaginal seeding, vertical transmission of cervical vaginal microbiota. Um, but there was actually really this interesting exchange in the British, British Journal of Obstetrics and Gynecology, uh, really trying to discuss uh, what is the real evidence of this procedure and is it safe? Um, and so I want to balance this discussion with uh, a, um, a thought-provoking commentary that was written by uh, Megan and um, Adam Ratner, who's at NYU, where they cite this report, uh, which describes a child developing um, herpes, uh, herpes simplex virus lesions um, after a scheduled C-section that was delivered following a vaginal microbiota transplantation. And what they reported was that the lesion timing and the symmetry of, on the eyelids, so at the actual inoculation and wipe site, those were consistent with vaginal microbiota transmit mediated acquisition. Um, but uh, there was no actual testing that was done of the swab material prior to it being performed. And as we all know, HSV, even though it's something that's routinely tested early in pregnancy, um, uh, many indiv pregnant individuals can asymptomatically shed. Uh, so it could be something that uh, we may miss. And so when we were working on, when we were sort of working on some of our uh, preclinical models trying to link uh, stress experiences across the lifespan, changes in the vaginal gut microbiota, and then what could be the, the long lasting consequences of this. Um, one of the things that we realize is that there, there, even though there are currently several dozen clinical trials assessing the efficacy and this, uh, actually just the efficacy um, of cervical vaginal um, seedings um, or even FMTs, uh, there's actually very little preclinical work uh, to link what are, what are the potential mechanistic effects of colonizing uh, newborns with different mixtures of microbes, but more importantly, what could actually be the consequence of colonizing babies uh, that may actually be delivered from a high-risk pregnancy, right? Because those settings are gonna be completely different. So one of the, um, so one of the primary questions that then we wanted to think about, or one of the uh, primary objectives that we wanted to do with some of our work following is to develop a human microbiota associated model that allows us to still use preclinical animals, right? So still be able to look at all of the, the things that we care about, right? So the mechanistic work, but being able to do this within a setting uh, that is translatable. So what would we have to do? Right, like what is the criteria that we would have to develop? Um, and uh, this is some of those, uh, some of these criteria were already developed in different fields, particularly with Josh Gordon in looking at how can we use similar uh, approaches to answer questions of postnatal microbiota development. And so we would first need uh, our population of interest, right? And we would have to be able to bank maternal, cervical, vaginal, or gut microbial samples across pregnancy. Uh, we would have to select these microbiota based on clinical phenotypes, right? So one of the obvious ones is, uh, did this pregnant individual uh, deliver preterm or not? Um, and then we would have to use, we would have to be able to use a mouse model where we could potentially inoculate those, um, those pups with different mixtures of microbiota. And then using the benefit of preclinical and mouse models, we would be able to look at things like microbiota dynamics. We would be able to look at uh, offspring milestones. So things like growth, behavior, development, and then look at things like immune development across the lifespan. So the quest, first question is, well, which can communities do we really look at, right? Which do we really focus on? Um, because there's a lot of work uh, that links microbial communities to many different clinical phenotypes. But what we really wanted to do is to get the best possible approximation of what an infant would first see in those early stages of the birth process. Uh, and what this really required us is to focus on the cervical vaginal microbiota. So as Sue actually mentioned, so I split my postdoc between Penn and then midway through my 
Um, my mentor, uh, Tracy Bale, was recruited to the University of Maryland. And this actually ended up being an incredible opportunity for us because we got to work with Jacques Revelle and Mary Reagan. Uh, Jacques was one of, the, um, uh, one of the individuals that was involved in the Human Microbiome Project. And so they had been conducting a lot of work um, using a prospective study that focused on the influence of things like diet, the cervical vaginal microbiome, and infant outcomes. So we then really had access to uh, a longitudinal prospective cohort where we would be able to not only already have information about these microbial communities, but we would be able to link them to long lasting outcomes. And so to the question is, which communities do we choose? And so we really chose two uh, fundamentally different communities. So what I'm showing you here is a heat map of um, a study that was done early, early days of the Human Microbiome Project, um, where if you uh, sequence uh, non, uh, so a reproductive non-pregnant individual, so you look at their uh, vaginal microbiota, um, and then you use a hierarchical, uh, unbiased hierarchical modeling, what you will see is that the vaginal microbiota will segregate into uh, sort of distinct community state types, as they call it. And so three of those, uh, four of those fives are dominated by different types of uh, lactobacillus communities. Um, and so the one that I'm highlighting in orange is CST1, which is lactobacillus crispatus. Um, and the reason for this will become obvious in just uh, one slide. And then um, there's another community state type, community state type four that is dominated, um, that, that sort of is uh, characterized by loss of uh, lactobacilli and an increase in presence uh, that is consistent with a polymicrobial mixture. So this means they have presence of a variety of anaerobes that includes Gardnerella vaginalis, Prevotella, and so on. Um, and what's really interesting is when you look at longitudinally at these community state types, uh, they very rarely transition into each other meaning that individuals very rarely uh, transition from a CST1 to a CST4 or vice versa. Uh, so again, to our question of what are two fundamentally unique communities can we look at uh, using our, our preclinical model to sort of move forward? Uh, the other uh, reason why we chose these is because some recent work from, this is now a few years ago, uh, from Nicolas Sagada's group uh, showed that you can recover reads that are mapping onto lactobacillus crispatus and certain members of CST4 uh, from fecal samples of babies within the first week of life. So this also then provides us sort of this orthogonal validation uh, for us to really look at those two samples. So this is the method that I mentioned that we developed. Basically, we use uh, mice, we conduct a C-section, we maintain them under uh, a sterile environment, and then now we have the ability to uh, colonize uh, these mice with various different mixtures of human mi uh, microbial communities, and then ask all of those questions that we would be interested in, right? Particularly focused on mechanism, safety, efficacy, um, and so on. So what does that look like? So this is me, uh, this is a pup that's about three minutes old um, and I am uh, taking a pick line and I'm guiding it down the esophagus into the stomach and releasing about 20 microliters of vaginal fluid uh, for colonization. And so for additional validation, what I'm showing you here is that basically within five minutes, of colonizing these pups, um, we see that uh, uh, using basically blue dye, uh, it's localized in the stomach, and then within two hours, we can see that the dye has pretty much gone throughout the entire intestine, um, showing that we can successfully colonize these pups. And so in the interest of time, um, I'm just going to give you uh, the, the broad summary of what we showed is that uh, when you colonize these animals with these two distinct microbial communities, uh, they result in changes um, in the transcriptome of the um, gastrointestinal tract. Um, they have differences in the peripheral uh, immune system and the peripheral immune compartment. And then we see differences in long lasting outcomes, including changes in body weight, peripheral immunity, and sort of hypothalamic circuitry that controls homeostatic pressures. But what we really wanted to get at is actually what I think it's fundamentally important for uh, clinical translation, which is 
Um, what would happen if in these settings, we colonize offspring or newborns that could be potentially coming from a high-risk pregnancy? So one of the ways that we modeled this is that we had uh, animals that were consuming a high fat, low fiber diet. So uh, these female mice showed uh, phenotypes that were consistent with obesity and glucose intolerance prior to pregnancy. And then what we did is that we added an additional stressor where these animals were um, colonized with Gardnerella vaginalis, right? To basically model uh, something similar to a vaginal infection. And then at 18, uh, day 18.5, which is uh, the afternoon prior to these um, uh, to moms naturally delivering. We did the C-section approach, and then we colonized these animals with that CST4 community, which is that polymicrobial mixture that I discussed. And so uh, I think that this is really the key takeaway with uh, some of these studies that we did, which is, uh, so these are the animals that just came from control, right? So we're looking here at percent survival. Um, we see that um, the, the animals are uh, completely fine. Um, there is a decrease in, uh, uh, there's an increase in mortality, so a decrease in survival um, if the animals uh, were uh, born from moms that were glucose intolerant and obese. And then similarly, if they were infected uh, by Gardnerella vaginalis. And then one of the things that was really surprising to us is that um, if you had both experiences, right? So if you developed with an in utero environment shaped by glucose intolerance and potentially obesity and colonized with Gardnerella vaginalis, the pups that were colonized with the CST4-like microbiome uh, just showed much, much lower survival rates. So about 40% survival relative to 100 to the other animals. And this seems to be related to just a huge, massive immune response in these animals uh, that come from sort of this double hit background. Um, and we validated this um, in uh, by looking at specifically at neutrophils. And so it's really suggesting that um, one, right, of course, these microbes are real biological um, systems. They have an effect on the host, but what really matters um, in these studies, if we're looking at clinical translation, is that we have to consider the state of preconception and we have to consider the state of pregnancy and how that may impact these systems. Um, and so th th we did, I did all of these studies during uh, my postdoc and then I moved on to McGee Women's Research Institute and uh, Pitt and I met these two amazing physician scientists, Christina Megley and Tom Hooven. And one of the things that they asked me is, well, have you considered GBS? Right, group B streptococcus turns out to be one of the most common um, microbes, bacteria that are um, isolated from um, placental cultures, particularly in indicated pregnancies. Um, and you can see that that things like group B strep um, are associated with maternal adverse outcomes. They're associated with neonatal outcomes. They're associated with uh, inflammation of the chorion. Um, but what's really interesting about GBS is that it's also a complete commensal, meaning that about 30 to 40% uh, percent of individuals are harboring uh, GBS at any point in time. And so it's not very clear, one, what, why is GBS hanging around? And what really happens when, uh, what's the trigger for it to become so pathogenic to result in preterm birth and neonatal sepsis early in life? So one of the things that we started thinking about is could we use some of the knowledge that we have about how diet may shape the gut microbiome and start thinking about it, how it may actually affect the cervical vaginal microbiota. So we just did a very simple study. So this is some work uh, that we recently uh, posted on BioArchive, where we just had three different groups of female mice um, on different diets. So this is a chow diet, a refined low-fat diet, and a refined high-fat, low-fiber diet. Um, and what I want to show you, what I want to highlight is that these, by these two diets, so the, the chow diet and the refined low-fat diet, they're actually, uh, in terms of the macronutrient content, they're supposed to be very similar, meaning that 
And there should be no differences between these groups. And when we look at you know, body weight gain, when we look at their glucose tolerance, uh, there are really no differences between these animals. But then we did, this, we did a study where we took these animals, we colonized them with group B strep. These are non-pregnant uh, female mice. And then we tracked clearance patterns um, in these uh, animals over a 30 day window, which is, this is typically when you start uh, seeing clearance of cervical vaginal uh, GBS. And uh, so this is just looking at a uh, Kaplan-Meier survival curve, basically showing you the clearance of uh, group B strep C0H1. Uh, uh, and one of the things that I want to highlight here, which was very surprising to us, is that the animals that are on a sort of a typical chow grain-based diet, uh, they showed a normal clearance pattern, right? So by about day 30, about 60% of all the females that we colonize show clearance. Consistently, what we would expect, the females that are consuming the high-fat diet, they show lower uh, clearance uh, of GBS. What was really shocking to us is that the animals that were consuming just a low-fat, low-fiber diet um, showed absolutely no clearance at all, right? during any of the 30-day uh, period. Um, and so what it turns out is that the way that these diets, right? So the diets that the, these animals are consuming has a profound effect of how the cervical vaginal microbiota will respond to infectious agents potentially. And so we did um, some uh, microbiome analysis. I'm just showing you the uh, two of the groups, so that the child diet and the refined high fat, low fiber diet. And one of the things that you see is uh, within a couple of days of colonizing uh, the cervical vaginal space with group B strep, you see that group B strep basically becomes the dominant uh, bacteria in this niche. And then it's slowly, uh, as it becomes cleared through a variety of different factors, it becomes overtaken by uh, another microbe. Um, what's really interesting, um, and speaking again to the necessity of thinking about other niches and how they may be interacting with the cervical vaginal microbiota, is that if we look at the dynamics of GBS clearance in the animals consuming the refined uh, high fat low fiber diet, uh, they show completely different effects. So similarly, uh, GB, uh, GBS takes over, but what happens then is that as GBS takes over, there is a separate bloom of E. coli and Enterococcus that occurs in these animals. Um, so showing that how dietary effects, right, which we typically think of as having an effect on the gut microbiome, are now also seemingly not only having an effect on what the micro, of cervical vaginal microbiota composition looks like prior to colonization by GBS, but also how the niche, the entire community, uh, reshapes and, and responds to uh, GBS, right? Like a very, very common uh, commensal that can turn pathogenic. And so one of the, the lessons really that, I, that I've learned in both working with uh, Chrissy and Tom and some of the other uh, physician scientists at McGee is that many of the interventions, particularly as we're thinking about microbes and sexual health, uh, that we use in the context of women's health are really sort of uh, on this principle that we're flipping of biological coins, right? Um, and not necessarily based on empirical evidence. And when it comes to sexual health, particularly in the way that we think about microbes, in some cases, the data just does not exist um, and clinicians sort of, we're just uh, making the best case efforts. And all this results in is in inertia and poor quality of life. And despite that, we do know that the health of the microbiome is linked to overall women's health status, disease risk, and treatment outcomes. And there's a really recent beautiful review that has highlighted these things uh, across various different uh, disease states of how things like the cervical vaginal microbiota and the gut microbiota could be affecting uh, not only a disease risk, uh, treatment resistance, but also the therapeutic potential um, of these uh, settings. One of the ways that we are specifically moving is really looking at uh, two primary unmet needs uh, that particularly is linked to sexual health. The first is actually pelvic organ relapse, prolapse. So this is something that happens very, very commonly 
particularly across the lifespan in perimenopausal and postmenopausal individuals, but also vaginal mesh complications. Uh, vaginal, vaginal mesh complications, so this is actually in pelvic floor reconstruction surgery, vaginal meshes are placed uh, to uh, protect the pelvic floor, but what tends to happen is actually rejection is very high, biofilms form around the vaginal mesh, um, and we actually have no idea how things like the cervical vaginal microbiota may either promote uh, resistance, so acceptance of the vaginal mesh, or they actually could provide further complications and ultimately rejection and having to go in and surgically remove the mesh. Right, so again, um, this is driving um, issues in quality of life. The other uh, area that we're uh, becoming very interested in, particularly as it relates to sexual and reproductive health, um, is sort of the broad category of gynecological cancers, uh, oncofertility, fertility preservation, but also assisted reproduction. So there's a lot of data coming out showing that uh, things like the cervical vaginal and the gut microbiota uh, affect outcomes of in vitro fertilization and assisted reproduction outcomes. And so I really wanna leave you, and I want to end this conversation with some food, food for thought. Um, this, this idea of uh, the relationship between women's health, maternal well-being, and offspring health um, has really been one of the most enduring socio and cultural fascinations. Uh, there's so many records of ancient and medieval physicians producing various techniques and preparations for making sure that the uterine environment was, as they say, as hospitable as possible. Um, and what they argued is that the most powerful pregnancy aid uh, was the maternal mind. Um, and you can see this, you can see this from uh, Serranus of Ephesus, who was the original authority of gynecology, to Aristotle, to even Rene Descartes, right? They really had this near obsession when it came to uh, women's health, the maternal mind, and how to um, basically uh, manipulate those things to produce a healthy offspring. And uh, as, as I discussed in my talk, you know, I started in neuroscience and I started at a time where uh, behavioral epigenetics uh, was really focused on similar narratives, right? How can we change maternal constitution um, to uh, not better the quality of life of the pregnant individual or of women's health across the lifespan, but really how can we actually better the child? And you know, in 10 years since conducting sort of uh, exist, uh, doing work in that research area, right? Um, we're starting to see uh, very similar trends and applications in the microbiome field. And I think that, you know, the discussions that we're having about referring to C-section deliveries and vaginal microbiota transplants as missed opportunities and linking these to lasting outcomes, uh, I think that uh, we have a challenge as a field to really anticipate how these terms and using things like missed opportunity, recovering, naturalizing, restoring normal development is really going to be interpreted in popular discussions. I think that we have a very large responsibility, particularly in the microbiome field, to think about this very carefully, particularly when we're studying maternal effects on health offspring. Um, there are studies that are coming out, particularly from New Zealand, where they're showing that pregnant individuals are starting to, uh, um, so after many decades of uh, pregnant individuals uh, feeling empowered about cesarean deliveries, about not, show, uh, not reporting guilt and shame, uh, this discussion of vaginal seeding and bacterial baptisms, um, the data is starting to show that um, they're starting, we're starting to sort of the cycle again, where pregnant individuals are starting to suggest that um, they're feeling shame because their uh, children are not being exposed to what's normal. And more and more of these individuals are starting to ask their doctors about a vaginal um, seeding. And so I think that um, we really have to think uh, critically and carefully about how this is uh, uh, transmitted and uh, uh, communicated to the public, um, uh, particularly when we're right now living in a time where um, giving birth in the United States is so dangerous to begin with. So I'll just leave you with that. Thank you for your sustained attention. Uh, I want to acknowledge all the incredible people that have helped us work on this uh, work, and I will leave it at that. Thank you.
Thank you so much, um, Eldon, for, for sharing some really incredible research that you've been part of over the last few years, and particularly for sharing that really important perspective that um, our research carries quite a bit of weight. And so even if we feel that it's so preliminary, um, it does get out there into the, the social sphere, and we need to sort of understand that um, there's some responsibility for that. Um, so there are a few questions that were in the Q&A related to sharing some materials. Um, so feel free to uh, respond directly to those um, by sharing some things in the chat, Eldon. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce our second speaker, um, Dr. Gia Daniels, and uh, sorry, Daniel, singular. Uh, and if, feel free to um, get your screen share up while I get uh, this going. There we are. So Dr. Daniel is an assistant professor at the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory University, where her program of research focuses on understanding the socio-cultural and environmental influences that affect sexual health behaviors and outcomes. She is particularly interested in sexual health outcomes of Black women that present as race-based disparities. Dr. Daniel is an Emory Building Interdisciplinary Research Careers in Women's Health Scholar and a Gilead Sciences Research Scholar who devotes her time to diversity-related initiatives in research and the nursing profession. She is also the co-author of Taking Action, Top 10 Priorities to Promote Health Equity and Well-Being in Nursing. Dr. Daniel is passionate about working with and in the community to serve others. She is a proud member of the National Black Nurses Association and has received the President's Trailblazer Award in 2023. Congratulations. Dr. Daniel earned a PhD in nursing from Emory University, a Master's of Science in Nursing from Augusta University, and a Bachelor of Liberal Studies from Mercer University. So please take it away. Hey, thank you so much for that introduction, Sue. And thank you to ASM for providing this platform for us to talk about microbes and sexual health. Uh, as Sue stated, my name is Dr. Gia Daniel, my pronouns are she, her, and my part of the talk will address behaviors and social contexts of sexual health. So first I'll quickly introduce myself to you and tell you about my program of research, then I'll dive a little deeper into sexual behaviors and social contexts of behaviors and outcomes as it relates to my work, and then I'll end with some action items. So I just wanna share a little more about me just to help you understand my lens. Um, so I was born and raised in South Georgia and I am quite fond of my Southern roots. Um, but my upbringing also exposed me to disparities related to racism, classism, sexism, ableism, and all the other isms. And while these, these exposures aren't unique to the South, it does seem that we are a bit slower to make and enforce change to promote equity. So as Sue stated, I went on to receive my master's in nursing and I worked as a registered nurse in the surgical transplant ICU at Emory University Hospital. Then I went back to school to get my PhD because I just had so many questions and was curious. So I got my, my PhD in nursing and I later completed an environmental health and toxicology T32 postdoctoral fellowship in the School of Public Health. And now I'm an assistant professor in the Nell Hodgson Woodruff School of Nursing at Emory. So next, my program of research. And for clarity, when I refer to women in my research, I'm referring to cisgender women because it's, that is the population I study. Um, my work may also be relevant to those with different identities who are also vulva and vagina owners. For my dissertation work, I focused on the vaginal microbiome. And from my perspective, the most apparent finding in the literature to me at the time was the consistent theme that Black women were lacking healthy vaginal bacteria like Tobacillus. Since race is social, not biological, that's one of my mottos, <laughs> I found this rhetoric to be quite troubling and was convinced that it, it was the behaviors and the social determinants of health experienced by Black women that led to this health disparity. Wanting to look deeper into this and inspired by the questions and concerns of black women who attended my presentations in the community, my program of research now focuses on sexual health behaviors and endocrine disrupting chemical exposures, which I'll talk about a little later, um, particularly focused on reproductive age black women. Uh, for my current program of research, I am a Emory Birch Scholar, 
Um, and for that, I've been able to develop a tool to assess social, social cultural influences on Black women's sexual health behaviors and to better understand their product use related to vaginal hygiene and sex-related activities. In my Gilead study, I'm using stored samples to assess endocrine disrupting chemicals in Black women living with HIV. For both the Birch and Gilead, I've been fortunate to work with the study populations from the Atlanta sites of two established longitudinal studies that have multiple sites. The Max Wise combined cohort study focuses on men and women respectively as well as the study of treatment and reproduction, which focuses exclusively on reproductive age women. Both studies include people who are living with HIV or who are at risk for acquiring HIV, but my studies include only Black women who are HIV seronegative. I'm also involved in research assessing clinicians' knowledge of PrEP, which stands for pre-exposure prophylaxis uh, to prevent HIV spread. In the community, we're working to increase access to comprehensive sex positive sexuality education and HIV testing and STI testing. So the comprehensive sex positive sexuality education is really important in Georgia as only um, abstinence based sex education is required by law. As we continue on in this webinar, I want you to remember in the words of Sally Foley, who was the first director of the University of Michigan Sexual Health Certificate Program, that talking about sex will change the world. After all, if we can talk comfortably about sex, we can probably talk about anything. So sexual health behaviors. Intravaginal practices, or IVPs, as I will sometimes refer to them, are the insertion of products into the vagina with fingers, cloths, or tools. The, purposes, the purpose of IVPs are related to hygiene and or sex, and these practices have been found to be more common in women of color. Examples of IVPs extend beyond vinegar and water found in douching products, which are often the focus of the research based in the US. But in actuality, women are also using soaps, creams, deodorants, herbs, steam, and many other products, all which may be commercial or homemade. And why is this a problem in case you haven't been informed? Well, IVPs are associated with disruptions in the vaginal microbiome, including causing bacterial vaginosis or BV. And those disruptions increase the risk of sexually transmitted diseases such as HPV and HIV. So a few notable STIs or STDs listed on the CDC's website. And just to be clear, STIs are the infections and are mostly asymptomatic, but they do refer to them as um, sexually transmitted diseases once they become symptomatic. So chlamydia, which is very common, um, is treatable, but if left untreated, it can make it difficult for women to get pregnant. Gonorrhea is also extremely common um, and one of the most common, um, but it can be treated as well. Of course, if left untreated, it'll cause um, severe, serious uh, health problems, but it's also important to note that unfortunately with the increase in overprescribed uh, antibiotics that we use today, these infections are becoming more difficult to treat. These, these uh, bacteria are becoming drug resistant. Viral hepatitis is the leading cause of cancer and the most common reason for liver transplants. Genital herpes is another common STD, but most people don't even know they have the infection. Um, there is no cure, but there are medications available that can prevent and shorten outbreaks. And then when you're in that stage, um, you're less likely to pass the infection on. HIV is the most common STI in the US, but most people with the infection have no symptoms and most people clear most strains of HPV. Um, they can cause some serious health effects like uh, cervical cancer, but they are preventable with vaccines.
social context. So when I was completing my dissertation work, this framework from Finley and colleagues was one of my favorite models because it put human health and disease into context. It showed how multiple aspects of an individual are integrated and how not just one part of a human exists in isolation when looking at health outcomes. As I previously mentioned, my work focuses on Black women, and in general, their behaviors may be modifiable, but the neighborhoods Black women live in are more likely to be, but the neighborhoods Black women are more likely to live in due to structural racism are not an easy fix. And so I wanted to touch a little bit on environmental justice. Environmental justice is, quote, the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. The people who live, work, and play in America's most polluted environments are commonly people of color and people living in poverty. And we know that's no accident. These communities are routinely targeted to host facilities that have negative environmental impacts. Companies divest from these communities. These communities have limited to no fresh produce available in their neighborhoods, creating food deserts. They don't have sidewalks or trees. All these things contribute to factors dumping waste there because these communities are not protected from these violations and they are not valued. The water crisis in Flint, Michigan and Jackson, Mississippi are prime, exam prime examples of this. These toxic exposures have consequences that lead to health disparities. And so one type of toxic exposure is endocrine disrupting chemicals, which is the um, environmental toxin that I focus on, on my current, in my current research. And they are found in many products used for vaginal hygiene and sexual activities. So endocrine disrupting chemicals are environmental compounds that can occur naturally, but are mostly manufactured and may disrupt the vaginal microbiome. Because they are found in many everyday products like plastics, food additives, detergents, beauty products, they're almost everywhere. Opportunities for cumulative exposure to EDCs can occur throughout the lifespan. Higher systemic levels of EDCs are found in women, which may not come as a surprise when you consider that people who identify as women are heavily, heavily targeted for use of beauty products and consequently use them more often. Unfortunately, EVDCs have a negative effect on reproductive health as they mimic or interfere with hormonal activity. These outcomes you see on the graphic here, early menopause, polycystic ovary, ovary syndrome, infertility, have all been associated to some extent with EDC exposure and fibroids as well. Due to the complexity of EDC exposure, it's hard to know what the fraction of risk is, but two thirds of cancers are thought to be environmentally caused. And so I want to be very clear that this is not just an individual problem. When you broaden the lens to include focus on communities and systems, the environmental justice movement is very important. It's a very important component this movement promotes the belief that no group of people should bear a disproportionate share of negative environmental consequences. EDCs have been found in menstrual hygiene products, including pads and tampons. And recent studies show that higher systemic levels of EDCs in Blacks compared to white women exist. This may be due not only to exposure of the products, but also um, the neighborhoods they live in. If they live in a food desert, they may um, be at higher risk of having higher rates of consuming um, processed foods, which definitely has EDCs. 
And so, uh, as I just mentioned, they're harmful. The EDCs are harmful to the reproductive system, but the effect of menstrual hygiene product on, vag on the vaginal environment isn't really known or studied. So the aim of this pilot study that you see the results for here, it was a secondary analysis. The aim was to assess the association between Black women's use of menstrual hygiene products and their vaginal pH levels with an abnormal pH level greater than 4.5, being a sexual health outcome suggestive of vaginal dysbiosis. For this analysis, 123 study visits from 24 women were included, where pad and tampon use were assessed. The use of pads only during a menstrual cycle occurred in 74% of the visits, and an abnormal vaginal pH was found in about 58% of those visits. We found that the use of both pads and tampons, both pads and tampons at the same time during a menstrual cycle occurred in about a quarter of or 24% of the study visits, and an abnormal vaginal pH was found in 80% of those visits. We concluded that the odds of having an abnormal vaginal pH is almost three times higher if both pads and tampons are used during the menstrual cycle as opposed to pads only. And so I'll end with some action items because if we don't move our conversations to actions, Nothing will ever change, and we'll still be talking about the same things 10, 20, 30, or more years from now. So, action items. Reciprocity in research. When working with research participants or even looking at their samples, find ways to give back. Yes, people are sometimes are paid to participate in research, but it's a small amount and one, maybe two or three times, depending on your research approach. So try finding ways to engage participants so they learn something that they can use elsewhere. Or if you have entry-level training opportunities where they can be involved in your research, ask if they're interested. The uncomfortable sex conversation. If we're going to address sex, we probably need to be comfortable talking about sex. And so grab some resources, talk to your friends, take a course, practice in the mirror. Any of these can help. Next, please don't leave your findings at a superficial level like race. Dig a little deeper, be innovative, explore other reasons for your outcomes. I promise you it's not just the color of one skin. I used to always say the color of my skin does not predict the bac bacteria in my vagina. And then inclusion and collaborations. When you're conducting research, especially in groups to which you do not belong, try finding a scientific collaborator who does belong to that group. Invite them in, seek their insight, let them be a part of the team not just at the ground level where they're collecting data, but in the, in the entire process of conducting your research study. Let them be decision makers in your research and how it's conducted. More action items, step outside of your comfort zone. I know a lot of people are introverts, but it's okay. This will help you expand your network and to see how your individual work fits into the broader context of science, which may increase your sense of purpose. And speaking of context, provide social context. So social determinants of health are commonly spoken about, and for some, it may have even become a buzzword. However, it's still important to consider not only the social, but also the political determinants of health when framing your work. Then you want to disseminate your work. Look for ways to get your work out there that don't put an undue financial burden on lay people. You can ask to speak to local groups. I know for me, um, the local WIC program, which provides assistance to low-income women so that they can afford food for themselves and, and their infants, I asked to speak to them. 
I talked to them about the, the vaginal microbiome. They were thrilled. They had so many questions. They wanted to know more. People want to know. You may be surprised to find that they are genuinely interested in learning about your work. I do caution though, depending on the level of complexity of your work, be sure to rehearse your talk with non-scientists to make sure that your talk actually makes sense. And then lastly, find community partners. They are trusted within the community and can provide great insight, especially if you're able to have a community advisory board. Now, I don't mean just find community partners, get what you need and run away. I mean, have some staying power. You may not even get anything out of the first interaction with the community partners, but this is about giving and serving others so we can promote health equity. So hearing from these community partners can trigger new research questions from the bench to the bedside. Don't underestimate the value of these conversations. And just to give you ex an example of uh, my work, I was presented with an opportunity to obtain funding from Direct Relief's Fund for Health Equity. I spoke with a few decision makers and got permission to actually apply for this funding opportunity under the community partner, which is Sister Love. Sister Love is a community-based organization focused on sexual and reproductive health and justice. It was started in the 80s to address the fact that Black women were being left out of the HIV AIDS conversation. And so we were awarded the fundings and were able to purchase and start a mobile sexual health clinic, which we affectionately call the Healthy Love Bus. And here are a few pictures on the slide. Um, it is a, a two room clinic and one room is used for intake and the other room actually has a bathroom and facilities and exam tables so that providers can um, conduct exams. And so, of course, I'm thrilled to be working with Sister Love in a minoritized and underserved community and to support and meet their sexual health needs. And so also another way, as far as reciprocity is concerned, I didn't just throw this money at them and then leave them hanging. I still continue to work with them. I actually meet with them on a weekly basis and we're looking for other opportunities to expand our services. Right now we're only um, doing sex, well, I shouldn't say only because that kind of minimizes it, but right now we're doing sexual health education and also um, conducting HIV and STI screenings and counseling in the event that, the, that someone tests positive and also connection to services, linkage to care. But I'm still continuing to work with them because we want to expand our services to include a nurse practitioner so we can provide more comprehensive care to the community. And so I'll wrap up by encouraging you to remember that sexual health is sexual justice. I'll say it again. Sexual health is sexual justice. And your work has a place in promoting health equity. Thank you. And here's my contact information. And I'm happy to take questions if we have time or we can move on to the panel. Thank you so much for that um, inspiring talk. I really love that community work that you highlighted. And I also really appreciated that you um, had us focus so much on digging deeper and getting all of these social contexts because so often as microbiome scientists, we're asking what people are doing and we never ask them why they're doing it and if they would choose to do something different if they could, which of course affects their microbiome, right? Um, so Absolutely. with the, yeah, in the interest of time, why don't we switch over to our panel? So just to remind our audience, you can ask questions in the Q&A and then I will go ahead and read them out. So I'll welcome back um, our two speakers, Gia Daniel and Eldon Nushadovich. And I will also welcome to the stage um, a third speaker who is joining us for the panel, Dottie Dotard. Um, so Dottie, uh, pronouns she, her, is a third year PhD student in Dr. Jack Gilbert's lab at the University of California in San Diego. Dottie completed her bachelor's degrees in biology and classical voice from Bard College in 2017. 
She went on to complete a post-baccalaureate research program at the University of Pennsylvania, and she earned a master's degree in molecular biology, cellular biology, and biochemistry from Boston University. Dottie is still fascinated by the sociological doings of uh, microbes and aims to focus her PhD research at UCSD on increasing our understanding of the effects of gender affirming hormone therapy on the microbiomes of gender diverse individuals in order to better inform gender diverse healthcare. And so um, as you are being welcomed to the stage, I'm going to uh, launch our sort of panel discussion by asking you some questions or uh, opening the stage with you, Dottie, um, and then we can bounce it around to our other panels. Um, so Dottie, previously you and I have talked quite a bit about the challenges to performing uh, your type of research and uh, explicitly naming social bias influencing some of that work. So can you um, sort of give us the rundown and expand on this topic a little bit? Yes, uh, and I think that also really relates to Gia's talk as well. Um, hi, I'm Dottie. Uh, it's I think trying to trying to do the research that really needs to be done almost always has to be done quite delicately, um, because I think the line that I've been going back and forth whether I really mean to or not is remembering that I'm not pathologizing people's lives, I'm not pathologizing people's choices, and I'm not just treating people like subjects. Um, and I think that those are real challenges. A part of how I've been trying to move past that is I've been very actively trying to work with people who know better. Um, and I think that's been really important for my process. Um, I have all my raw abstract PhD kid ideas, uh, but really getting to talk with the gender affirming uh, clinicians here at UCSD, we have a really happy, healthy gender health program and um, people who are really excited to do research and try to try to in increase what we know, trying to trying to focus on really bridging some of the gaps that they see in terms of uh, like clinical presentations and trying to kind of move past just associative clinical studies, but really trying to make bench science happen to, to make long-term long -term changes. Um, and really being able to tap into people who, who have a day-to-day -day understanding of how to interact with the subjects and and treat them as people with futures um, has been really important to my work. Um, and also recognizing that in certain fields, like the ones that the one that I'm working in, that there's a lot of sort of political charge in the background. Um, I'm fortunate to live in a state that's a little bit less charged, but there's certainly plenty of states. I'm also from Georgia. Uh, I'm from Macon, so I know exactly where Mercer is. Uh, but I know there are certainly other states where the backdrop is a lot more charged. So um, really, I've been really fortunate to do my research in a place where I have a lot of resources, but I know that other people doing this research might not have those resources. So when people are really trying to do this work, reaching out to people like the people on this panel right now is a really, really important step. Yeah, Gia or, or Eldon, would you like to expand upon that? <laughs> Don't jump my she, yeah, said go ahead. she said it really beautifully. No need to add. Yeah, perfect. Um, in that case, uh, we've also previously talked about all of us together, um, the need for holistic research rather than just quantitative only or focusing on yes, no questions. So adding that context. Um, so understanding behavior is really complicated. Microbiome research can't be reduced to one dimension in itself. Um, and yet we often try to reduce our study subjects, our people's behaviors into these yes, no one dimensions. Um, so um, I, again, will throw that out to anyone on the panel or all of you on the panel um, to kind of comment on, um, challenges and opportunities to working with such a multifaceted research topic? I'll start. Uh, so I try to be very intentional about including people's voices, um, especially when working with minoritized communities. Uh, so I always incorporate some form of qualitative work just to have a why or a deeper answer to whatever I find. Yes, you can check a box that says yes or no, that you use a product, but I need to know why you use that product. How can I properly intervene? I feel like millions, if not billions of dollars have been spent on research interventions that don't work because nobody consulted the people for whom the research was targeted towards. And so in order to get over that huge barrier, you simply have to talk to people. 
And so I think we have to get outside of our box, get outside of our office, get outside of our labs, get into the community and talk to people. Even if you're doing work at the bench, it belongs to someone. It's connected to a human in some way. Or even if you don't know it's who, who even if you don't know who it's connected to, there's a population that exists that can relate to the person who you receive those samples from. So with that in mind, ask them what's going on related to how your findings came out. I just think it's so important to have that interpretation and that lens from the people who actually have the lived experience. And so there's a lot of value in that. And yes, you do get some pushback, whether it be funding or manuscript publications or whatever, because 20 people, 20 interviews is quite a good amount for qualitative work. Whereas when you're looking at quantitative work, people want hundreds, if not thousands of samples. And so when people don't fully understand how qualitative work is conducted, there can be a bit of pushback there. I can't deny that, but it's also important for us to educate them, to let them know. But I wouldn't stop just because somebody pushed back, just keep pushing. Yeah, that's an amazing perspective. Um, especially, yeah, you're, you're very right. It can be difficult to justify this or to convince um, journal editors or reviewers or funders that this is important work. And yet you uh, can throw any amount of that interview or any amount of that information and say like, yes, we got really important feedback. Like this clearly works. And so, um, you know, if we all keep pushing a little bit, we'll eventually sort of all move the field. Um, Eldon or Dottie, did you want to comment further on that? Yeah, um, it's really interesting participating in this panel um, right after. So I just a couple of days ago met with the Greater Pittsburgh Food Bank, right, that serves um, about 100,000 families in the uh, greater sort of Western Pennsylvania area. And one of the things that struck me, right, is that a lot of the things that we do, right, which is it's always sort of bench to bedside, back to bench. And we very rarely, I think, to, to the points of uh, today, we rarely actually then go like, out this way, right? So like, how do you actually uh, fill in that gap of maybe even distribution, maybe even education, right? Like the, there, there are systems already that are very healthy, uh, that are running, that are doing the education, right? That have markets, that have pickup centers that can uh, do all of that, a lot of these things. And particularly when we're talking about, you know, nutritional interventions, dietary interventions, whatever the case may be in terms of what we're thinking about, um, you know, those systems already exist. Uh, but the question is like, why are we not making those bridges happen, right? The, the microbiome is one of these very beautiful, uh, important uh, lessons where we can actually do that very rarely, right? Neuroscience is very difficult to do that, right? To bridge that gap. But the microbiome does that, right? And it goes back to this holistic infrastructure, right? That that exists. Um, but we do have to do that incredibly hard work. Uh, and, you know, we have to think outside of the natural normal funding mechanisms, right? Because NIH is not really going to give you the money to figure out partnership, uh, you know, between, you know, something like the, the food bank and how can you actually think about whether these real interventions uh, work or, or if they actually have any impact, right? Uh, those end up being big risks. Uh, and it does also then require qualitative work, right? Because you have to get to know these families. Uh, and th that became so evidently obvious of, you know, the, the work that is ahead of us, but the nice thing being that there are systems already in place, right? So, yeah. Oh, yeah, go ahead, Dodie. Yeah, I think that's a really, really important point, uh, especially with regards to the funding mechanisms part. Um, and I think also really taking into account that a lot of the communities that we serve are um, pretty traditionally marginalized in the healthcare system. Um, like for example, the words transsexual came from doctors, did not come from the community and trying to even use words that are community owned and not community branded um, I think are, are, is, is important. And um, I actually, uh, I've just finished submitting a fellowship and was doing a bunch of research for um, 
trying to show why my research is important. Uh, and I just saw this study that um, like 5% of people under 30 now identify as uh, as non-binary or trans, as gender diverse. And that's like one in 20. So, so really trying to figure out how to bridge these gaps in a timely manner like this, it's really going to impact the whole future uh, of, of, of healthcare, um, especially sexual healthcare for people who really don't get a lot of screen time in terms of what happy, healthy sex and like sexual lives look like, uh, let alone like sexual microbes of any kind. Um, the, the field that I work in is very, very small, like N of 10 studies. Um, and so what, what's been a real pleasure to me as someone who has a, a really big, happy, healthy group of friends who identify as gender diverse is, you know, based on a lot of the statistics, they're late 20 somethings who who are curious and they want to know what's happening with their bodies and they want to know how they can treat their bodies in a way that feels respectful to the fact that they're also trying to respect internal identities. So um, I think trying to trying to bridge gaps in terms of what people need and what people want when people also want to participate and they want to be educated. It's really inspiring. Um, and I'm hopeful that what it will mean for people even seeing that the research is being done will be exciting and will open up those kinds of conversations. Um, I, I certainly have had probably more conversations about various kinds of sex with my PI, like when, when we have these conversations that I think a lot of people do uh, at this stage in their graduate career. <laughs> um, but it is really important, like how do certain microbes go certain places and why would they show up in the vaginal microbiome, right? Like there are, there are certain, there, like we're saying certain qualitative measures that need to be considered and not in a way that ultimately pathologizes them. And I think that's kind of the work, especially in my world that needs to be done. Yeah, I, I want to add to that. So one of the things that's been really fascinating, right, having, uh, you know, McGee Women's Hospital across from us where they do about 10 to 15,000 deliveries a year is also learning how different systems are co-opted for different things, right? So the REI clinic, for example, that does a lot of fertility preservation, it turns out that uh, prior to transition, a great deal number of gender diverse individuals will actually go to the fertility preservation clinics uh, to ensure sort of uh, that they want to have some aspect of fertility preservations, right? So, so there are systems also sort of capture uh, different people also at different stages of life uh, and we're not doing that great of a job, right, of uh, making them stakeholders and brokers of their own work, right? Um, and yeah, it's 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 quite shocking um, that there are these uh, sort of instances where things would, would work. And then there's also this issue that I always come back to when it comes to things like the C-section work or even trying to think about the, the dance that we have to do with sexual health networks work right um we 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 ha it becomes really difficult right so in the vaginal microbiota field when it comes to c-section they're, they're starting to emerge this idea of like the best donor which is immediately right so like who is the primary donor who is the i forget what it was but it was like and and it's you know largely based on um these very difficult narratives that are starting to emerge and, and you can see it, right? You can see where this is going. If we, if we accept the things like uh, VMTs, because this is the, the struggle of FMTs, right? Like who is the right FMT donor? And then we go into, well, who's the right VMT donor? And then this will become a very difficult conversation very quickly. And it's, it's also like the field is not having it because to both of your points, right? We're, doing way too much work trying to think trying to sort of build progress in the field and there's very few checkpoints uh when it comes to ethics when it comes to uh social when it comes to actually public interest right uh there's very little discussion of like does the public really even care about you know any of this in the way that the science is progressing in a way that does not being boundaried by uh, public participation uh yeah. You mentioned as the public even care. I think about people um, who science is like imposing these thoughts and interventions and all these different things on, and they haven't even asked the people what they need. 
Yep. Like who cares about the microbiome if I don't have anything to eat? Yeah. You know, so going back to your point about the food bank, like being able to have a list of resources for your research participants to share um, on hand is always very helpful. Partnering with the community. I can't stress the community enough how important it is to get your work out there to help them and for them to in turn help you. And then your ideas are innovative. It's collaborative. It just makes for better better science overall, science that people care about, science that people are interested in. After all, we're taxpaying citizens. We're paying for a lot of this science anyway. And so I feel like we should have access to it and we should be a part of it. Um, you're, you're all the best. Yeah, you've queued up my, my next question really, really well. Um, so uh, you've sort of all spoken about kind of this disparity between um, how researchers are trained and reality and how um, sometimes the terms that we're using are out of date or not at all the right terms that the community is using. Sometimes you've spoken about um, how we really struggle to engage or even you know, find people to work with in the community and how we're not really trained to do this. And so um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here with this uh, webinar to um, show how we all got to where we are and what really worked. And so if there are resources that you found really impactful for understanding these terms and figuring out the right ones, finding that community, learning how to practice that talk, um, as Gia mentioned in the, the um, mirror, I'd love to hear all of those from you. So I just want to say uh, kudos to M Systems for your current perspective that was just on your webpage on trans inclusive and queer conferences, right? And what that looks like for microbiology. So that's one thing, right? Uh, I think ASM and M Systems and M Bio, right, has really, really uh, paved the way of, of making this area more inclusive, right? So I will definitely say that you know, I was, I was really actually surprised when I went into the webpage today and that was like the top billing. Um, I think that's brave. Sorry. <laughs> uh, I would say that um, unlike a lot of other people, a lot of other places, um, I had the very distinct privilege of going to an undergraduate university um, where I was maybe one of, no, I was pretty much the only straight person that I knew. Um, and that's definitely not most people. Most people exist in a, a very straight world. Uh, and I, de I definitely did until I got uh, to college. And uh, through those four years, I ended up be becoming just really inundated in, in a world that I didn't even know existed. Uh, and feeling so grateful, especially now for that kind of like access and exposure and, and acceptance. Ultimately it's, it was about the acceptance. Like, uh, that was really important for me. Um, and really just becoming, I don't know, enamored with the community wh whose core values are about having to accept who you are. Uh, and so I, it really came at, at, at a time for me where, you know, you're 18 and, we're all just trying to figure out who we are. And I, I started to watch people that I knew transition and start to use different pronouns and start to dress differently and start to find themselves and what that journey looked like. And so I had four years of constant exposure. The first day we talked about the gender unicorn, like now I know that's not most people's uh, college education. So I would say we all kind of got this sort of side education and just being really understanding of uh, like gender and uh, that I didn't realize what a privilege that was until I left. Um, because I mean, now, you know, you read studies that are, that are coming out now and between like 20 and 30% of people now know someone who, who uses maybe they, them pronouns, um, which is really amazing by the way. Um, but really that early exposure and, and, you know, really being in a lot of situations where I was watching things happen um, and, and watching other people have the same questions as me, but they were just very brave and willing to, to, to make these changes for themselves and seeing how happy people were after, um, and all that really deeply impacted me. Um, and a big part of why I wanted to do this research in the first place is one of my really good friends had a partner who, um, had just recently come out of trans and decided to go on to, uh, e estrogen and actually had a pretty severe seizure because there wasn't enough research that showed the relationships between uh, increased estrogen 
in like AMAB bodies and the interactions that you can have with seizure medication. And um, that really, they, I mean, they looked at me and they're like, there's just, there's just nothing. There's no research. And that's not my world. Um, like neuro is not my world respectfully. Um, but microbiome really is. And I, I found my place in where I could be helpful. And um, I think really, really reminding people that what we're trying to protect is worth it, uh, I think is really important. Um, it's, it's like people's dignity and people's joy. Um, that's really what motivates me. And I think just remembering that the kind of narratives that we're trying to push to the forefront are narratives that have been, I guess the right way to say it is exploited. Um, a lot of, a lot of people who are the ones who are really driving culture, driving, driving so much of what we, what we use now, but we don't necessarily give them the credit, um, are the, are the people that we're also trying to serve. Uh, and so remembering that we are trying to bring visibility into a space where even people who look like us are trying to be like visibly pushed back, you know, affirmative action just got revoked. Like we're still very much in a space where there's, there's a, a lack of visibility and they're trying to keep it that way. So understanding that like trying to subvert narratives like this are really challenging. Um, and the kind of pushback either at the institutional level or even at the research level uh, can be really overwhelming. And to have a good support team like this kind of team, because we all face, maybe they're not the exact same obstacles, but the obstacles come from the same tree, it's different fruit, same tree. So um, understanding you need a good team is also really important. So admittedly, my first response is very simplistic, and it is Google. Google could be your friend. <laughs> so um, the thing is, though, when you Google, you have to be very thoughtful about which resources you click on. Don't necessarily click on the first one. I usually lean more towards the .orgs, and then I look up a little about the history of the .orgs that I'm clicking on and, re and referring to, because I don't know everything and I can't always pick up the phone or send a quick email um, and expect a response immediately. And so when I don't know, I ask. Like I tell nursing students all the time, if you don't know, ask. Um, and then speaking of my nursing students, I always tell them that intent matters. People can feel, people can sense your intention. And so when you go into spaces that you may not be familiar with or nobody looks like you, Offering up yourself, offering up your thoughts, not being a know-it-all, not telling people what to do with their own bodies and their own lives, but offering up what you have and being sincere and genuine, it goes a long way. People respect you more. People will open up to you. Intent matters. And I can't stress that enough because even when I mess up, people forgive me because they know my heart. They know that I mean well. And it's just, it's just very powerful and impactful when working in spaces where um, maybe you come from a privileged background versus the people that you're working with, or you have opportunities that others don't, or access, or knowledge, or whatever it is. Um, intention matters so much. I used to tell my patients at the bedside, I don't know everything, but I know somebody who knows whatever you're answering. If I can't answer it, I know somebody who knows or they know somebody who knows, I'm gonna get you what you need. And so they immediately saw my intent. They immediately knew that I was there to provide the best care. And I've translated that over into how I conduct my research as well. Yeah, I think that brings up a really um, important point for anyone who is trying to engage with new communities is, you know, you may have great intent, but they don't know you yet. And so they don't know that. Um, so you do have to bring your authentic self and, and be willing to share where you're at and give it time. Um, certainly any conversation with any study participant, any community takes time to build some trust and for them to understand what it is that you're trying to get out of that interaction. And so just allowing them the space to share, but not necessarily forcing um, answers to your every question can be uh, really meaningful and really powerful. 
Um, and so we are uh, starting to get down to the end of our time, but we're not quite there yet. Um, and so what I'm, uh, what I've, I've heard over and over from all three of you is that this can be really difficult and challenging work, but it's also extremely rewarding, right? You clearly all love your work. You're clearly all really passionate about it. Um, and so um, if there's any advice or um, highlighting how people who don't have very many resources um, can engage with this or how communities that don't have very many resources can engage with this. Um, so we'll end on kind of an empowering message um, and I will, I will float it to whoever would like to go first. I'll say that resources don't necessarily have to equal money. Resources can be time. You may not have a lot of resources. The people you're trying to help may not have a lot of resources, but if they're doing, if they're throwing an event in the community or they're curious about something and you have that knowledge and that time to support them, have at it. That is a way that you can be involved. And then who knows what impact you may make. I think uh, educating, educating oneself can look 5 million different ways because there's 5 million different ways to learn. Um, and really, especially like if you're trying to start moving your way into understanding queerness in the queer, queer world, like the queer world runs art, you know, uh, and, and really understanding uh, that you can watch a beautiful show like Pose where you can see people's experiences and see them portrayed by actors who live those experiences or listening to podcasts that are like podcasts in particular are um, it's, it's a very kind of un nationally re regulated news source. Right. And so you'll have to also notice like who's on the news, right? Who are those people compared to a place like podcasts and who's the majority of those people, right? It's, you know, there's thinking about who has power and, and how that power gets distributed when you go to news sources, like, people where people can share their experiences in a way that's not as regulated by the the true powers that be you can really learn a lot about what people struggle with and um even sources like reddit like understanding understanding where people are coming from people are desperate to know people are also curious and they're afraid you know and and really getting to see the human side of people who aren't like you i think is really what inspires me um, and also um, can educate other people who haven't had the same experiences. Um, I would say we need you, right? So in this, you know, in this climate of, you know, people leaving academia for various different reasons. And, um, you know, at the time that we're starting to recognize what, what participant oriented science looks like and, and getting communities involved and having communities as stakeholders and knowledge brokers, right? That was one of the things that I learned uh, when, so when we moved from uh, Penn to, to downtown Baltimore, right? It's really these difficult conversations back to what if your community doesn't really care about what you're studying, right? So, uh, you know, the, the, the really difficult conversations of presenting a talk and talking about, you know, stress is this and stress is this, and this is what trauma looks like, but never actually evoking the people that are being affected by those things every single day, right? And involving them. And so I think that we, we need community, we need stakeholders from the community, we, we need to, uh, to the point earlier made, right? Uh, we also need that input because, um, one of the things I learned when I came to 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 McGee uh, is, you know, we spend a lot of time thinking very deeply about our science and very rigorously and thinking about all of these, you know, very rigorous questions. And then you start talking to different people and, you know, it's the point of collaborating, right? But you start talking to different people and you realize like, oh, this is how we can sort of work together. This is how you can work together. It's the same thing, right? With uh, actually making your local community as a stakeholder, you start to realize uh, the science that can be profoundly impactful, right? If we do that. And I think that to me, that's, that's, uh, we need, uh, more people in this conversation, right? Uh, particularly in this field, right? We're sort of at such a precipice when it comes to all of this. Uh, and we need to sort of direct it in a way that it is uh, equitable and just. Absolutely, thank you so much. Okay, so we are, um, 
down to the end of our scheduled time. I do apologize to a few people who asked more mechanistic questions in the chat. Um, we can maybe follow up with our speakers directly after that, but I felt that it was a really important opportunity for us to have kind of these broader conversations while we've um, got an international stage to talk about sex and microbes. Um, so I just want to thank uh, all three of our experts again um, for this wonderful opportunity. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your expertise. Thank you so much for the work that you're doing um, and for all of the, the time and effort and heart that you put into us um, on behalf of the broader microbes and social equity community. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. Thanks, everybody. Bye.